everyone, we're gonna get started. So good morning to everyone. So on behalf of the Department of Justice, Division of Law Enforcement, and Bureau of Gambling Control, I'd like to welcome you to this workshop today to discuss the issue of the rotation of the player dealer position. Uh, my name is Stephanie Shimazu. I'm the director of the Bureau of Gambling Control. Um, so, this is the seventh um, in a series of workshops that the Bureau has conducted in various cities throughout the state this year, and actually last year. So after the last workshop earlier this year, uh, the Bureau indicated that it would hold an additional workshop in Sacramento and provide some draft language for discussion. We thank everyone for your patience during this process as we reviewed previous comments and drafted language to share with you. We hope to obtain a lot of valuable input today and hear your thoughts on the language provided. To emphasize that the Bureau has not started the formal rulemaking process on this matter. We are currently in the informal pre-regulatory stages. So at this time, we are looking for input from stakeholders and the public that can be helpful once we begin the formal process. When the formal process does begin, we will be sure to let everybody know. So I understand that individuals may feel strongly about this issue, but please know that today's workshop will be conducted in a civil collegial manner. As stated in previous workshops, while there may be opposing views and opinions on this issue, it is possible to have civil, constructive, and professional discussions. So please keep this in mind throughout the discussions today. We can't tolerate discussions or behavior that are discourteous or disrespectful of others. Additionally, with so many people interested in participating in the process and wishing to present input today, it will be important for everyone to keep their comments to three minutes, and we'll let you know um, once you come up to speak. Uh, the plan is to end at one o'clock today. So we will wait until you have completed your presentation before asking for any clarification or questions that we may have, so we don't cut into your allotted time. If you have already submitted your comments to the Bureau and have new put in today, you may wish to concentrate on that new input. Please note that all written comments submitted to the Bureau through the process will be public and posted to the Bureau's regulation website. Now, I know I've said this before, but again, this is a workshop, and we are in the informal stages of the regulatory process. So we strongly encourage you to voice your thoughts and provide legal support for your comments, as well as alternative language if you feel it is needed. The ultimate goal of these workshops is to develop a regulation change which provides clarity to the existing statutory provisions for licensees and direction on how to incorporate this into game rules with the statutory framework in mind. So thank you again. We look forward to a productive day. And with that, I'm gonna turn things over to the moderator. Good morning, my name is Suzanne George and I am the Regulations Coordinator for the Bureau of Gambling Control. Um, first things first, I have to ask you all to please be mindful of the exit doors. We cannot block the exit doors. So there are some seats up here in the front. We also cannot block the entrance to the restroom. So um, folks you may have to come over here to the side a little bit more, but there are some seats in the front as well as um, some within the crowd. And I'll wait for you all to move. All right, thank you so much. Um, joining me today, in addition to Director Shimazu, are Yolanda Morrow, Assistant Director of the Bureau's Licensing Unit, Nate Diwali, Assistant Director, Compliance and Enforcement, Brent Joe, Deputy Attorney General, and Misty Trejo. It is a little after nine o'clock on Wednesday, December the 18th, 2019. The Bureau of Gambling Control has scheduled this regulations workshop at the Ben Ali Shrine Center in Sacramento, California. This workshop is scheduled to discuss concept language that has been drafted on the issue of the rotation of the player dealer position. Notice and an agenda of this workshop have been previously published to the Bureau's regulations webpage and sent in an email to interested parties. The agenda and partic oh, I'm so sorry. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, entrance to the restrooms is located through those doors that have a giant clock above that. Um, we ask again that you do not block the entrance to the restroom, so folks, you're going to have to um, scooch over just a bit. Thank you so much. Um, today's workshop is scheduled to go until 1 o'clock. This may include a short break. The entire workshop discussion is being recorded. 
Uh, Sign-in sheets. If you have not had an opportunity to sign in, if you are planning on presenting comments, uh, either impact comments or legal analysis, please visit our sign-in table. And excuse me, folks, we can't block the exit doors. It's starting to sound like a stewardess here. So sorry, folks, please don't block the exit doors. Thank you so much. The sign-in sheets will be used to call persons in the order of sign-in who wish to present legal opinions and comments concerning the uh, concept language that was sent out to the rulemaking list. Uh, first, legal analysis and uh, suggested text changes, and those would be comments of folks who have signed in on the yellow sheet will be called first, and then comments uh, to discuss impact to the community or as a result of the rulemaking will be called next. Uh, you were issued a number when you signed in on the white sheets. Please keep in mind that you will be called by number. In the interest of time, the Bureau will limit speakers to three minutes and comments must be limited to the issues of rotation of the player dealer position as noticed for this workshop. Other issues or regulations will not be covered topics in the workshop. When your name or number is called, we ask that you please come to this podium where there's a microphone. Please uh, state and spell your name and identify the organization that you represent, if applicable. The concept language was distributed to the Bureau's rulemaking distribution list in advance of today's workshop. This concept language is subject to further review and revision by the Bureau. The version which would be included in the initial notice of this regulation, as well as the final version of any text submitted to the Office of Administrative Law at the conclusion of the formal rulemaking process may be different from what was distributed for today's workshop. Please be advised that the Bureau has not yet initiated the formal rulemaking process and is presenting this concept language for the benefit of stakeholders and other interested persons so that they may provide comments and analyses on the concept language. The Bureau will provide notification once the formal rulemaking process has been initiated. So for an, an introduction of the topic, in 1984, the California Constitution was amended with the voter initiative, Proposition 37, at the November 6, 1984 general election. Proposition 37, also known as the California State Lottery Act of 1984, added provisions of government code and amended the California Constitution to authorize the establishment of a statewide lottery in California. In addition, Proposition 37 also added to the California Constitution the prohibition in California of gambling casinos the type that exist in Nevada and New Jersey. Until this proposition was enacted, casino gambling was prohibited within California by a statute, not within the Constitution. Chapter 10 of the Penal Code contains code sections specific to gambling, sections 330 through 337Z. Penal Code Section 330 first enacted in 1872 prohibited six specifically named games or any banking game played with cards, dice, or any other device for money, checks, credit, or any other representative, uh, representative of value. This section was amended four times since 1872, extending the list of specifically named games and changing the penalty and sentencing structure. In 2000, Section 330.11 was added to the Penal Code. In 2001, Section 330.11 was amended by Assembly Bill 54. Penal Section 330.11 provides banking game or banked game does not include a controlled game if published rules of the game feature a player dealer position and provide that this position must be continuously and systematically rotated amongst each of the participants during the play of the game. Ensure that the player dealer is able to win or lose only a fixed and limited wager during the play of the game and preclude the house, another entity, a player, or an observer from maintaining or operating as a bank during the course of the game. For purposes of this section, it is not the intent of the legislature to mandate acceptance of the, play, of the deal by every player if the division finds that the rules of the game render the maintenance of or operation of a bank impossible by other means. The house shall not occupy the player dealer position. There is not, however, any text within the California Constitution or the statutes of California that defines what constitutes continuous 
continuously and systematic rotation of the player dealer position. The Gambling Control Act in Business and Professions Code Section 19826, Subdivision G, assigns the Department of Justice Bureau of Gambling Control the responsibility of approving the play of any controlled game in gambling establishments within California, including placing restrictions and limitations on how a game may be played. The Gambling Control Act also mandates the adoption of regulations which provide for the approval of game rules by the Bureau to ensure fairness to the public and compliance with state law. The topic of rotation of the player dealer position is now open for public discussion. We will be discussing the legal analysis and suggested uh, text changes and the first speaker is Scott Crowell. Good morning, uh, Scott Crowell, C-R-O-W-E-L-L. -L. I'm here on today on behalf of the uh, Santa Inez Band of Chumash Indians and the Rincon Band of Luisano Indians. I have a longer written statement, but I'll uh, uh, want to make uh, four points in my three minutes. Uh, number one, the concept language is a positive step and that properly reflects the reality that the ongoing activities of California's commercial card rooms are illegal. As you know, the tribes have been at this in terms of trying to work with the state for more than 10 years through hearings and meetings and workshops. Uh, and, uh, and I, for one, believe this is the first concrete positive step towards correcting a longstanding problem. Number two, we do have workability and enforceability concerns regarding the concept language. The efforts to ensure that there is a systematic and continuous rotation, and by continuous we mean continuously or without break, are embedded in the concept language. Yet to be properly implemented, each and every table will need to be properly monitored and audited for compliance. The card rooms have a long track record of skirting the law, not only with dealer rotations, but with illegal advertising, non-compliance with Vincent's money laundering regulations, all in addition to offering banked card games. Any rule along the lines proposed will be another empty promise without the controls, including proper video surveillance, immediately accessible to state regulators, required to document card room activities, followed up with serious, frequent, and detailed forensic auditing to ensure compliance. Three, the concept language remains woefully deficient. It still allows for bank card games to be conducted off of Indian lands. The concept language still allows the player dealer rotation scheme currently being utilized in California card rooms to survive. Banking even a single hand of a card game makes that an illegal bank game. Banking by third party proposition players makes the card game an illegal bank game as well. Allowing the card rooms to operate bank games, however, frequently and systematically the dealer position rotates is in direct opposition to the California Constitution, Section 19E, which prohibits casinos, the type of which are currently operating in Nevada and New Jersey. Consistent with that constitutional prohibition, Penal Code 330 forbids, among other things, the play of any banking or percentage game. In 1997, in the context of Proposition 5, the California tribes proposed a similar scheme with player pools serving as the bank. In 1998, the California Supreme Court struck down Proposition 5 because the player's pool bank games were still bank card games, thus violating Section 19E. That is why the tribes, together with Governor Davis, worked to pass the Constitutional Proposition 1A in March of 2000. The tribes had to convince the people of the state of California to agree to amend the state constitution to allow for the play of bank card games on Indian lands. The California card room should be held to the same standard. Thank you. Thank and if you. you have written comments, I can accept them as well. Great. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Jimmy Gutierrez. Good morning, Ms. Shimazu and those of you at the head table. My name is Jimmy Gutierrez. I'm an attorney. I'm general counsel for the California Cities Gaming Authority, consisting of cities in California that have card clubs because the cities have a vested interest 
in the revenue from the car clubs and the operation of the businesses and the positive economic impact that those businesses have in the city, not to exclude employment, which is a big factor of it. Uh, I would say that the proposed regulation is a great example of what the Bureau seeks to do. It's very clear. The Bureau seeks to require every player at the table to accept the deal. The, the proposed regulation would prohibit any player at the play to stop playing if he or she refuses to accept the game. So by this regulation, effectively speaking, uh, the Bureau would nullify over 100 years of legislative authority for California games or non-banking games. I remind you that the Bureau is not the legislature. The Bureau is not the judiciary. The Bureau is a part of the executive branch of California. As early as 1872, the California legislature, in adopting Section 330 to the Penal Code, authorized the play of non-banking games by not prohibiting it. Then in 1992, the legislature established a standard for non-banking games in Penal Code Section 330.11. And one of the important elements of that is that a player, every player is not required to accept the deal. And that's true even if the Bureau finds that the rule of, ga of the games prohibit the operation of a bank by any other means. So this regulation effectively nullifies that legislation. Now I've submitted to you my written comments of a legal analysis. Uh, but I want to briefly review those. Number one, uh, the Bureau does not have the authority to adopt a regulation on the player-dealer player position. Number two, the proposed regulation would nullify Penal Code Section 330.11 as well as Business and Professions Code 19805. The proposed regulation is contrary to the Administrative Procedure Act because a regulation contradicts existing statutes. The proposed regulation is not authorized because in seeking to provide a new definition of the player-dealer position, the Bureau is effectively regulating and it violates the separation of power. For the same reason, the reinterpretation of the player-dealer position in the regulation constitutes a judicial interpretation, which is another violation of the separation of powers doctrine. Thank you. Tori Big Knife. Good morning. Uh, my name is Tori Big Knife. I'm Attorney General with the VA House Band of Kumeyaay Indians. So, why are we here today? I know a lot of people have been asking that question. And I've tried to answer it a few times in earlier sessions. Uh, it's because the illegal banked games are taking place in car rooms right now, today. And we've often asked when we've come up here for enforcement today. But we understand that the Bureau decided to take a different tact and hold a whole host of hearings and discussions, listening sessions, to get everybody's viewpoint on both the law, and I know there's also been a lot of discussion about impact. And I think that process now has gone on for over a year, and I recognize that it was a very deliberative process, and obviously went into the drafting of the proposed concept language or regulation that the Bureau is now considering as it's submitted. One of the comment papers that you'll see suggests that 65 to 70 percent of the revenue that the card rooms are generating today, this is their words, not mine, is derived from those games that we contend are illegally banked games. Now, if that's not an interest in banked games in violation of the law, I don't know what is. Now, the Bureau is here today because they're charged with the enforcement of the gaming laws. And I think the draft concept language is a great start. It's consistent with the law. 
noticed on the bottom of it that it actually cites to the applicable law. So it wasn't just created out of whole cloth. It's very consistent with the penal code and it's very consistent, most importantly, with the game rules that have been in effect for a long time. That industry standard that I've talked about before that was actually created by the card rooms after the Oliver decision came out and all of the rules that they then submitted to the Bureau for approval and those rules that were then approved. So the concept that somehow this regulation is going to result in the need to rescind a whole bunch of game rules, it's just not correct. In fact, most of those rules will withstand what this proposed regulation says and indeed will continue to operate. And I join in the comments that were made earlier, really the question at the end of the day is then how does the Bureau go about enforcing that, monitoring it, and making sure that it continues to take place. The last thing I would suggest and, and request is some of, us, some of us have been at this process for eight years now, um, trying to get a resolution on this issue. It didn't just start last year for us. And we would ask that the Bureau immediately start those, that regulatory process and get moving on it so that we can get some resolution on this issue. Thank you. Alice Langton, Langston Stone, or Sloan. My name is Alice Langton Sloan, and I rep I'm representing my family who have been disenrolled from their tribes in regards to this. I can't tell you about the legal analysis, but before you can get to a legal analysis, you have to look and understand the social impacts that it has on families when you make changes. One of the things that I have seen since the enactment of gaming in California, and my family has been here long before California has become a state, long before the United States became the United States. And when we forget when we're making laws is about the impact to family, and that has a big difference. When you see gaming, and the thousands, and there's been over 12,000 Native Americans, legitimate, federally recognized Native Americans who have been disenrolled from their tribes because of gaming. We have not set up anything to help them for, to provide continued housing, education, or other general assistance services to help them. We have not put in a pot, yet you have a pot to help the tribes that are non-gaming. A million dollars goes to those individual tribes Half of that is divided amongst their, uh, in, in my husband's tribe, half of that goes in per caps to payments to the individuals. But it doesn't go to the families that have been hurt. That impact affects California through general welfare, TANF, assistance. They don't get those services from their tribes. They are impacted in the state of California on top of all of that. Three things that we would like to recommend be added to the text under gaming. And that is that um, if you are going to continue to allow gaming in non-native card rooms, that it still be allowed so that it doesn't impact the 32,000 other families in the state of California. And that tribes who engage in disenrollment, that they um, are not allowed to participate in any card room game activities. And should they be allowed, that I ask that this committee recommend to the legislature that disenrollment um, families, that a, that a uh, separate pot is there to help them to achieve the same things that were promised by the government centuries ago when they were doing compacts. Thank you. Keith Sharp. I hope the long journey from the back didn't cut into my time. Um, good morning, uh, Director Shimazu and members of the uh, Bureau of Gambling Control. My name is Keith Sharp, S-H-A-R-P, here on behalf of the Gardens Casino and other casinos that I represent. I'm going to limit my remarks to two points this morning. The first is 
to note that the Bureau has a serious due process problem in connection with its dealings on this matter. Uh, the Bureau, like all administrative agencies, has only those powers that are expressly granted to it by the Constitution or by statute. Uh, there is nothing in the Constitution or in any statute whatsoever which grants the Bureau the, the power to unilaterally revoke existing player-dealer game approvals without any adjudicatory determination whatsoever. In short, the Bureau cannot unilaterally decide to itself act as judge, jury, and executioner. To the contrary, throughout the language of the Gambling Control Act, it is abundantly clear that the Bureau is to act only in a prosecutorial manner, and that it is the Commission, the Gambling Control Commission, who acts in an adjudicatory role in determining whether a game approval should be withdrawn. If the Bureau believes that a game approval should be with revoked, it must follow the process carefully in, uh, that is laid out in the Gambling Control Act by beginning with an accusation, bringing that before the Commission, carrying the burden of proof to prove its case and allowing the commission to make a decision. There are, further, there are then further due process uh, remedies that are available after the commission's decision is made. For the Bureau to do otherwise uh, than adhere to this process is to deny due process to the card rooms. My second point on suggested text changes, just three years ago, after a year's worth of discussions with a group of card room industry representatives and others, the Bureau adopted player dealers uh, rotation standards, which, while not perfect, would have allowed the games to continue in existence. I know this because I was a member among that group of industry representatives, and you know this because several of you who are sitting here today participated in those discussions and represented the Bureau and the Attorney General in those discussions. You, the Bureau, several of you, agreed with the, with these standards that were adopted, you adopted them, and began the process of requiring compliance with them. Ultimately, the Office of Administrative Law determined on procedural grounds, not substantive grounds, that those were underground regulations. The right thing for the Bureau to do at that point would have been to take those standards that you had agreed to and you had begun to implement and carry them through the formal regulatory process. Instead, after holding a series of workshops on uh, non-existent proposed regulations, the Bureau published this concept language which bears absolutely no relationship whatsoever to the standards that you had originally agreed to. You have to ask yourself, why, what changed? What caused the Bureau to pivot essentially 180 degrees and go in a different direction? I urge the Bureau to revisit the previously adopted standards and use those as the basis of its deliberations on this matter. Thank you. John Plata. Good morning, my name is John Plata. I'm general counsel for the Agua Caliente Band of Cahuilla Indians. My last name is spelled P-L-A-T-A. -A. And I want, I want to uh, echo some earlier comments in that the tribe believes that uh, this concept language is a huge step in the right direction. Uh, it's the first uh, language we've seen from the Bureau that really, uh, that we believe really reflects the law, uh, the Constitution, uh, and Penal Code 33011. Uh, it, in ATRE versus Davis, the California Supreme Court considered the scope and effect of Section 19E of the California Constitution uh, in a case challenging the constitutionality of Prop 5 enacted in 98, which was the first attempt to authorize a governor to negotiate and enter into tribal state compacts pursuant to the Indian Gaming Regulatory Act. The court found that, among other things, Section 19E was designed precisely to elevate the statutory prohibitions on a set of gambling activities to a constitutional level. That court also enumerated the statutory prohibitions in effect at the time 19E was adopted in 1984, uh, and that included banking games. Um, and with the exception of the uh, of 19F, which was later later added to the Constitution, um, with the exception of those that constitutional amendment in 19F, the effect of Section 19E was to endow the statutory gambling prohibitions in place at the time Section 19E was adopted with constitutional status and to prohibit the legislature from relaxing those prohibitions. 
Because the California Supreme Court found that 19E of the California Constitution elevated the banking game prohibition to a constitutional level, the legislature would not have the authority to permit activities in Section 330.11 that would not be permitted under Section 330 as it had been interpreted by the courts. Uh, so based on the holding in, in Oliver, uh, Section 330.11 cannot be interpreted in a manner that would exempt a game from the prohibition against banking games if under the rules of that game there is a potential that one player could act as a player dealer for repeated hands. Uh, so the tribe, the tribe believes that the Constitution has to mean something, that the penal code has to mean something, and we think that you guys are headed in the right direction with the concept paper, and we look forward to the rulemaking process. Uh, during that process, uh, which we hope moves forward rapidly, we'll be, uh, we'll be submitting written comments. Thank you. Thank you. Kyle Kirkland. Good morning. I'm Kyle, I'm Kyle Kirkland, I'm president of the California Gaming Association, Director Shimatsu and others. Thank you for having us here. Um, just as a housekeeping matter, is there, what's the process for letting other folks in the, in the room here that have sort of been excluded? Are we letting them in as others go out or is it? So um, we have reached capacity in this room. Right. So um, in order to have others come into the room, um, people will have to leave. Okay, so um, is it fair for us if, if there are others outside, if we suggest that maybe some other folks leave so others can come in, is that, is that fair for us to do? Um, however you would okay. wish to handle it, but we are at capacity, and I'll take this opportunity one more time. Please, folks, we cannot block the exit doors. Okay, thank you much. Kyle, so as I on, said, just, hold on one second. Oh, I'm sorry. Folks, please. Thank you. Okay. My name is Kyle Kirkland. I'm president of the California Gaming Association, and we appreciate the opportunity to contribute here today. In uh, October of 2019, we commissioned an economic study that determined the California card room industry generates 5.6 billion of annual economic impact, 500 million of annual state and local taxes, and over 32,000 jobs in underserved communities. Our industry matters to an awful lot of people and communities in this state, including many of those directly behind me. Last week, the CGA submitted written comments to the Bureau's proposed concept language. It was about an eight or nine page letter that went in considerable detail. We believe the language as presented is deeply flawed. First, we believe the Bureau doesn't have standing to issue these regulations based on the lack of any real legal or safety need. Second, the concept language conflicts with and is unsupported by existing law or precedent, as my colleagues have discussed or will discuss further. And third, if implemented as proposed, the language will crush a $5.6 billion industry that supports dozens of communities and thousands of working families. The CGA has been to every previous workshop and multiple meetings with the Bureau. We've asked for legal rationale for new game regulations and heard nothing, no specifics. We've also asked to see any deta uh, detail or evidence of complaint to, from, or harm to the public. Again, we haven't seen anything. What we do know is that our games are legal and have been for decades. Three previous attorney generals have approved them and allowed us to operate and provide real value to our communities and at least four separate court rulings have confirmed the illegality. It's not enough for our tribal colleagues to say that they're, they're illegal. They need a legal precedent or a court ruling. So earlier this year, the Ochidehe tribe and others sued the governor over our games. A federal judge dismissed those claims. To the south, the Rincon tribe filed a suit against Southern California card rooms over our games. A state judge there has told them twice that they do not have standing to do so. To its credit, the legislature has rejected the tribe's efforts, so much so that the tribes have now 
run an initiative to try to give them police powers over card rooms. And although no one else is giving the tribes traction that they want, and they have no real legal basis for it, the Bureau continues to accommodate their arguments. Some have called this concept language a slap in the face. It's not. This is the Bureau pulling us over, putting a spike strip down, and telling us to get off the road because the guys in Rolls Royces don't like sharing it with us. We're not causing any harm to others. We're, we're going on the speed limit. They just don't want us on the road, even though we're the only ones paying license fees and gas tax. If the Bureau doesn't know how devastating these proposed changes are, it should take a harder look at the economic works that's been done. And, it, and if it does, we believe it has a legal and moral obligation to tell the people why it's taking action, such punitive action without justification. Thank you. Tracy Buck Walsh. <coughs> Jeff Butler. Good morning, my name is Jeff Butler, B-U-T-L-E-R, and I represent the Yochadihi Band of Wintun Indians. Uh, like the prior uh, tribal representatives who have spoken, I think that the concept that you've come up with is a step in the right direction, though not perfect, and we will be submitting some written comments at a later point. There's two things, though, that I would like to address. And the first is the notion that the card rooms have anything really to say about this issue. And the reason why I say that is because the card rooms themselves created an industry standard of a two-hand rotation, which is what that concept that you have proposed says. How do I know that? Well, yesterday, I went on the Bureau's own website and pulled down a couple of rules. And I'd like to read uh, at least one of them to you. And this is from the Bicycle Casino. It's a no-bust 21th century blackjack rule. And under the heading legal, it says, the player dealer position must rotate in a continuous and systematic fashion and cannot be occupied by one person for more than two consecutive hands. There must be an intervening player dealer so that no single player can continually occupy the player dealer position within the meaning of Oliver v. County of Los Angeles, 19. 98, 66, Cal App 4th, 1397, and they even cite the page number 1408 to 1409. The rule goes on, if there is not an intervening person occupying the player dealer's position, the game will be broke or stopped as required by the California Penal Code. I agree with that legal statement in those rules. But let's keep in mind that I didn't propose that legal statement. You didn't propose that legal statement. The people who proposed that legal statement were the card rooms. So they are the ones who established that industry standard. And I think all that your concept does is legitimize that industry standard. With that, I'll leave it alone. Thanks. Steve Bodmer. Good morning. My name is Steve Bodmer, General Counsel for the Pechanga Band of Lasano Indians. Last name is B-O-D-M-E-R. I'll keep my comments brief, as uh, many of our colleagues have already stated the rationale behind our support for the concept regulation. So the concept regulation represents guidance that is consistent with the laws and case laws of the state of California, as well as the established standards set by the card room industry itself. 
with regard to defining continuous and systematic rotation of the player dealer position. This concept regulation is movement on one of several critical issues raised to the Bureau to bring the card room industry into compliance with the expectations of the laws of California. We'll be submitting additional comments. Thank you very much. Are there any other uh, legal analysis or suggested change comments, presenters? All right, seeing none, we'll be moving on to the um, impact comment list of participants and calling number, uh, participant number one. You should have been given a number when you signed in. Good morning. My name is Tasha Serda, and the last name is spelled C-E-R-D-A, and I'm the mayor of the city of Gardena. Thank you for having this workshop today to give those of us the opportunity to speak before you. In Gardena, we're fortunate to have two card rooms, the Hustler Casino and the Lucky Lady Casino, which are owned by the same company and currently offers over 1,100 good-paying long-term jobs to our residents and those in our surrounding cities. Our city relies tremendously on the tax revenues coming from our card rooms, which is about $8.4 million per year. With the proposed changes, we estimate reductions to be about 50% of our casino revenues, or about $4 million a year. Our casino revenues pay a significant portion of our general fund expenditures, which include public safety, recreation, city infrastructure, and many more city-sponsored events. The regulations being proposed today will have significant, devastating effects to our community, our residents, and our businesses. The new regulations not only affect our city staff, but it also affects our card room employees, which amounts to over 1,100 jobs, as I previously stated, but it will also affect the over 61,000 residents of my community in the city of Gardena, who continually rely on the city to provide quality, vital services. Those that will be impacted are the elimination of the special enforcement units that focuses on organized crime, human trafficking and violent offenders task force, the elimination of early release and probation enforcement units, the elimination of school resource officer programs, officers assigned to vital services, the elimination of the city's juvenile justice and intervention program, a program which keeps our young offenders out of the criminal justice system and provides counseling and services for their future with a success rate of over 93%. Senior transportation that provides rides for our senior medical appointments, grocery shopping, and going on social outings. Homeless hotel vouchers, elderly nutrition programs that provide daily meals for our seniors at our senior center, and also those uh, who are homebound. Care management for homebound seniors, which includes comprehensive in-home assessment and care plans that allow residents to age in their home and not inside of an institution. It will also affect the repairing of potholes, sidewalks, trash in the public right-of-way, graffiti, and sewer maintenance. This also stunts the economic development growth. Both of our card rooms serve as an anchor to tenants an anchor tenant to several other businesses, which are thriving because of our card rooms. If these proposed regulations go into effect, you will not only be hurting just the card rooms, but you'll be hurting our entire community. I'm glad I had the opportunity to share this information with the Attorney General when I met with him, myself, and a couple of other elected officials, and I just hope that we weren't wasting our time when we shared this information with him. I also hold a dual role as a chairperson of the California City's Gaming Authority, which is a CCGA, an organization whose purpose is to promote and protect the common economic concerns and engage in public policy issues of card rooms, which represent 66 card rooms um, that are small and medium sized in California. And just as my city would be impacted, also these other cities would be faced with the same thing. It will be the same effect, just a different financial impact. Thank you again for letting me come before you, and please remember our faces when you decide to make these changes. Thank you. Speaker number two. Morning, uh, Director Shimatsu and uh, members of the Bureau of Gambling Control. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak this morning. My name is Clint Osorio, C-L-I-N-T. Last name is O-S-O-R-I-O. -O, and I'm the city manager for the city of Gardena. The city of Gardena has two card rooms, uh, Lucky Lady, uh, the Lucky Lady and the Hustler Casino. 
Our city's relationship with the card rooms has had a tremendous impact in our community as legalized gaming revenues have helped the city with much needed resources to provide the very best service to our residents, our business partners, and our community. The proposed new regulations will place a tremendous financial burden to our card rooms and, sub and subsequently to our city as well. The city of Gardena relies on legalized gaming revenues and the proposed new regulations will negatively impact how the games are played. The Lucky Lady and Hustler Casino employ over 1,100 individuals, many of whom call the city of Gardena their home. If these new regulations are put in place, the disruption in gameplay will ultimately drive down demand, in play, demand to play in our casinos, ultimately forcing management to cut staffing by as much as half, leaving many long-time workers in our casinos and residents of our city without jobs. Our estimates indicate that, this, that a disruption in gameplay of this magnitude would cut card room revenues by as much as 50%. Such a decrease in their revenues will mean that the city revenues from card clubs will also be reduced by 50%. The city of Gardena's annual revenues from card club activities is over $8 million, and cutting that in half would be a devastating impact to our city. The city will have no choice but to cut our budgets up to and including layoffs. Many city programs rely on our casinos and the proposed new regulations also mean reductions if not eliminations of vital city programs. As an example, our city pri prides itself with having a premier law enforcement agency in the South Bay and LA County. Uh, our juvenile justice intervention program as highlighted by our mayor is one of the best which help at, uh, help at risk youth from falling into the criminal justice system. Um, just to put this into perspective uh, on how important these programs are, just the other day I met with a young lady um, who in her teens uh, was heading the wrong, wrong, wrong path. Um, her parents ultimately enrolled her in the uh, juvenile justice program uh, and now she just uh, graduated and finished her master's in social work and she's now going out helping uh, other kids that are at risk. Please remember that the proposed new regulations will impact not only the over 1,100 workers at our casinos, the over 500 staff members that our city employs, but it will also negatively impact the fathers, the mothers, the children, and the seniors that make up the over 60,000 residents that call our city home. We only ask that you allow us to continue to make a difference in our city. We ask that you allow us to continue to change, to, to, to continue to change and save people's lives. Thank you for, for your time. Speaker number three. Good morning. My name is Mike Safel and I serve as the Chief of Police for the City of Gardena. The City of Gardena, as you know, has two card rooms, the Hustler Casino and the Lucky Lady. Both have been significant employers offering over 1,100 quality long-term jobs to our community and specifically to the residents of Gardena. And I say 1,100, I know it's been repeated before, but it's not just a number, it's the people that are sitting in the audience today and that's who we represent. The Hustler and Lucky Lady generate $8 million in local tax revenue that helps fund city services like our police department. My department has had a positive partnership with both casinos for decades. We have provided training for their staff over the years, including response to critical incidents like uh, active shooter. Both casinos have been active in contributing to the quality of life of our community. They have contributed time and resources to many of our initiatives designed to give back to the community. These two casinos have made positive impacts to our citizens' quality of life and have made significant contributions to make Gardena a great place to live, work, and play. In short, they have helped me and us in our policing mission. Our city relies on the tax revenues from the Hustler Casino and Lucky Lady to ensure the funding of our police department and the safety of our community. In short, without this funding, the quality of life of our residents will decrease significantly. The potential decreases in funding will create a budget deficit causing mandatory cuts in vital policing services, including personnel and police officers, which will place the safety of the public and local community in jeopardy. With decreased revenue, my police department will be unable to replace vital policing equipment. Programs such as in-car video cameras and body-worn cameras could no longer be an option for our department. Special programs, as mentioned before, such as our Gardena Juvenile Justice and Intervention Program, uh, will be gone. The proposed changes will have a real and direct impact on all the residents of the city of Gardena 
including loss of jobs and loss of cri critical revenue that supports our police department. The proposed changes will negatively affect our ability to protect and serve our community. I ask that you take into account the communities who rely on this tax revenue from card rooms and reconsider these proposed regulation changes. Thank you. Speaker number four. Good morning. My name is John Goodwin. That's J-O-H-N-G-O-O-D-W-I-N. I'm the mayor of Colma, California. Our city is fortunate enough to call Lucky Chances Casino a neighbor, employer, and generous supporter to our community. The reductions in revenue for Lucky Chances that would be caused by the Bureau's proposed changes and regulations would have a real and direct negative impact on all the businesses and residents in my city. The proposed changes in regulations would mean lost jobs for residents, the loss of revenue we need for vital city services, and reduced economic activity. In Colma, Lucky Chances is our city's largest employer. They provide over 500 good paying, reliable jobs for our community. The jobs provided by Lucky Chances are a major reason why our community continues to thrive. Many of these jobs do not require a college degree or prior experience. They are accessible to everyone and allow Colma residents from all walks of life to provide for their families and play a positive role in the community. These proposed changes in regulations would also harm our community's economic activity and could cause a loss of over $91 million in economic impact that Lucky Chances generates. Lucky Chances is a great corporate citizen and community partner and has donated hundreds of thousands of dollars to many local and regional nonprofit charities serving many communities and populations. One of the local charities that is a beneficiary of Lucky Chances is the North County Food Pantry and Dining Center. Without their support, the dining center would experience severe cutbacks and may even have to close their doors. This is one of many examples of nonprofit entities that Lucky Chances regularly supports. In addition, our city greatly relies on the tax revenue from Lucky Chances. In fact, last year alone, tax revenue from Lucky Chances accounted for $4.5 million, or 22% of our city's budget. This helps pay for our law enforcement to protect our city, public works and planning department to improve our city, as well as park and recreation services that include cultural events, our local literacy program, at-risk teen programs, and children's events. I ask that you take the welfare of the city of Colma and its residents into account, but also consider the employees of Lucky Chances and all the supporting businesses that benefit from Lucky Chances as well. Please reconsider these proposed changes to card room gaming regulations. Thank you. Speaker number five. And while he's making his way to the podium, ladies and gentlemen, please do not block the exits. There are several seats up here in the front row. You're welcome to come and have a seat. Uh, good morning, Dr Director Shimazu and panel. Uh, thank you very much for having us here today for our comments. My name is Patrick Berry. I'm the general manager of Players Casino in Ventura, California. I'm also uh, on the board of directors of the CGA. And I just want to say I've been in this business for over 30 years now, the card room industry. Started a small place and worked at a couple others. And I'm the last person in the world that wants to get up and speak in front of people. But yesterday I, I just felt like I had to say a few things and ask uh, one question. So. For me, the concept language is not reasonable. It, like Mr. Sharp said, there was a, some reasonable uh, proposals a few years ago, and, and I think we've gone away from that. And, and I think I, you know, I speak for our 170 employees, the city and the surrounding community, and I ask, uh, why now? That's, that's a question I think a lot of people ask, and for me, it's pretty simple. Uh, we're one of the card rooms that was 
named in the lawsuit, uh, the tribal lawsuit in November of 2018. And for me, this just seems like it's all coming from them. So uh, the greed of the tribes is, is pretty evident. And just as far as impact, uh, the regulations would infect our em employees. I'm 60, just turned 60. I'm, my career is not that, uh, maybe doesn't have that much uh, longer to go. We have young employees who have uh, built their lives. They've made commitments. They bought houses uh, based on their jobs, what they have now. They had no reason to believe that their way of living would be affected just from a, a bolt of lightning. And even, even some of the older employees, they made career choices. They chose to go into the card room industry and leave you know, educated people, left, left good paying jobs because of the stability, the uh, uh, ability to make an, uh, a good living in the, in the card room industry. Uh, the regulations could affect our city. We have some people from the city of Ontario who are going to speak to that. Uh, nonprofits in our community who we try to help. So, uh, just want to say, please consider all that when you're, uh, the regulations are coming up. I know those aren't tech technical arguments, but they're they're real uh, and they affect a lot of people. Thank you. Speaker number six. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ning Garcia, and as of August this year, I'm the president and general manager of Rogelio's and Ielton. We're a restaurant, hotel, bar, and card room, and it's a family business that my father opened in 1981, uh, but it struggled with in the last decade. The town and the business are currently in a state of distress. What was once known as the Little Paris of the Delta was described by the Sacramento County Grand Jury Report as a city in perpetual crisis. I chose to take on the role of bringing the town and the business back to life because I believed that I could introduce player dealer games and given our other amenities, offer a one of a kind resort destination, bringing much needed jobs, revenue and tax dollars to a local struggling economy. We are currently only regularly offering poker and only two days a week at that. In a small town like ours, it's hard to get 10 people together at the same time that want to play. The beauty of player dealer games is that if one person walks into play, he's able to if a third party proposition player is present. The changes he proposed to make would be extremely harmful to my business and community as it would stifle my plans for expansion. On behalf of my customers and community, I strongly urge you not to go through with these proposed changes. Thank you. Speaker 7. Good morning, Madam Chair, uh, Directors. Uh, my name is Matt LeVere. I have the, the privilege of serving as the mayor of the city of Ventura. Um, with all due respect, uh, this is about the last place in the world I feel like being at this morning. <laughs> I've got about a million things I need to be doing at home right now. But when my police chief uh, called me uh, a couple days ago and told me about the proposed regulations, I, I had no choice but to be here this morning. That's how scared I am about the real world implications of what these proposed regulations will mean for my city. Um, everything the mayors and the police chiefs have said about, or said about these regulations before me is absolutely true in Ventura as well. Uh, in Ventura, it's close to 200 high paying jobs, jobs that my community cannot afford to lose. Uh, we are fortunate enough to have the Players Club Casino in Ventura. They have been an incredible, incredible community partner, a corporate partner. Uh, they contribute over $2 million a year, every year, to our general fund. We're not that big of a city. $2 million is a lot of money to us. And let's say they just cut 50% of that because of these regulations. They also are neighboring to our second biggest tax generator, which is our auto mall. I mean, this would have an impact across the board in the city of Ventura. I mean, I think it's going to be a minimum of $2 million. And so let's talk about the real world. When you look at me as mayor and say, Mayor, you need to cut $2 million from your budget, here's what goes through my mind. Who am I going to have to lay off? What fire station am I going to close? 
What parks, what roads, what sidewalks am I not going to maintain? These are the real world decisions that I'm going to have to face when you tell me that you're shutting down the card rooms effectively, the table games with this new regulation, and I'm going, wow, here's, here's what that means to me. Please don't put me in that position. Cities are in a precarious, uh, <laughs> our financial situations in the cities, as you know, are terrible across the board. We're starting this year's budget cycle, $250,000 in the hole before we even start. The last thing we can afford is another $2 million hit, especially when the system right now works. The tribal casinos are doing just fine. The card rooms are doing fine. Nothing's broken, so why are we fixing it? Let's keep the system in place, a system that works, a system that's reasonable. And I just beg you, please don't put me in the position of having to lay off my employees. Thank you very much for having me. Speaker number eight. Good morning, Director, uh, Commissioners Barry Fisher, B-A-R-R-Y, last name Fisher, F-I-S-H-E-R. I'm the Deputy City Manager of the City of Ventura. Um, I'm going to narrow things down a little bit from what the Mayor just spoke of. Uh, when we had the last recession, uh, we had to close a fire station. We lost 15 police officers. Uh, as some of you may be aware, uh, two years ago we had the Thomas fire. We lost 500 homes. Luckily, we were able to put that station back into service through uh, city council action a couple years ago through a separate funding source. Uh, the mayor uh, mentioned uh, $250,000 loss starting out of the gate. Um, I just received an email from our finance director. I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor, to catch you off guard here, uh, but it's more devastating than that. We're looking at a $6 million deficit right now going into next fiscal year. A $2 million hit, a $1 million hit is putting us over the edge. Uh, with the Thomas fire, uh, the police department evacuated 16,000 people. The fire department saved a lot of homes. Although we lost 500, it could have been worse. Don't make us shut down another fire station. Don't cut our police services. Our police go to answer 100,000 calls a year. Our fire department is at 18,000 calls a year. Cutting another fire station is lengthening response times to emergency medical calls and fires. This is real. This is, I was born and raised in the county of Ventura. This is real stuff. Regulations that you're proposing to put into place, there's faces behind that. I'm one of them, our firefighters are, our police are. It's, it's devastating uh, to hear that we're even at this point. So please take into consideration the cities that this is affects, not only the uh, employees at the local players club, city employees, uh, our local businesses. Uh, it's much bigger than you think. So please reconsider even going down this path. Uh, they've operated for a long time with no issues. Uh, we have a great relationship they put back into the community. Uh, please keep us whole. Thank you. Speaker number nine. Hello, my name is Teresa Vandal, V-A-N-D-A-L, and I'm here representing Napa Valley Casino. I'm in the Human Resource Department of Napa Valley Casino. We're a small card room, but we employ 90 employees directly and another 40 with our third player provider services. You know, we provide benefits for our employees to help health benefits. We pay a living wage. If these proposals go through, we're gonna lose 80% of our staff. And even though we're small, that's huge for us. Our, our employees enjoy working. We're a young group. We need these jobs. These people have families to support. We support our city with a percentage of our revenue going to the city of American Canyon, which provides community services. We are active in our charities around the community. 
you know, we, we're just a, a little guy, but these proposal changes are going to kill us. You know, let's keep these jobs for these people. Let's keep these families healthy and happy and employed. Thank you. Speaker 10. Good morning. My name is Vaughn Altizer, V-O-N-A-L-T-I-Z-E-R, a president and co-owner of Napa Valley Casino. I came to America as a refugee in 1981. I want to share with you my personal story, my personal experience having uh, having been a dealer myself for about 12 years, from, two, from 1994 to 2006, I was grateful to be working as a dealer because it allowed me, as a single mother, and the, th and the time with, a limit edu with limited education and resources to be able to quit my two full-time job, buy a house, and provide for my families. One of my biggest concerns working as a dealer was my health. However, as a dealer in a casino, being part of a smoking environment was expected. I have ex experienced first, firsthand what it felt like to endure a cigarette smoke blow in my face, all because the customer was upset over losing money. When I heard smoke-free car room in California, I saw an opportunity. Of course, I was living in Arizona at the time. The cost living in California was outreach for, for me. But a few years later, an even better opportunity came up. I partnered up with two other people, mortgaged my home, cashed out my 401k, and sold everything for a down payment. By 2006, Napa Valley Casino started with nine employees. We now have over 90 employees and plus 40 by third-party player services. Our card room currently operates 12 tables, three poker tables, and nine cow games. I am a proud owner and a provider with living wage job for my employee and their family, families. I'm blessed to have this opportunity to make a difference by also providing smoke-free environment in my employee. I have responsibility to my employee, their family who are depending on my, our card room, and those employed by third party player services. I'm currently, if the current proposal passes, the, co the cost operating will force us to lay off about 80% of our employee and a third party provider. This, propo this proposal will impact not only my card room, but also many other card room in California. I ask that the Bureau, please, we consider this proposal the financial impact significant. Many lives and families will be forever changed for the worse if this were to pass. Thank you. Speaker number 11. Good morning. I'm Beth Hassett, the CEO of Weave. Uh, Weave is Sacramento County's primary provider of services to victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, and sex trafficking. My last name is H-A-S-S-E-T-T. I just wanted to put a face on some of the good work that these casinos do in communities and share Weave's experience with Stone's Gambling Hall. We've partnered with Stone's Gambling Hall in 2018 when they hosted the big 24-hour give back in Sacramento and San Diego. As a part of the 24-hour event, Stone's Gambling Hall donated 75,000 to Weave and secured another 5,000 from Sammy's Woodfire Pizza, which is housed inside Stone's. The funds were critical to Weave in that they were unrestricted, which allows us to meet the demand for services and respond to emerging needs, which is very difficult given that a huge chunk of our funding comes from government grants, which are very restrictive. Stone's Gambling Hall also allowed Weave to use their meeting rooms and hospitality space throughout the event, which included an opportunity for us to hold a meet and greet breakfast with members of the Citrus Heights Police Department and build a foundation for a new partnership, which has flourished and we now have direct federal funding 
to have a full-time violence response team which responds with officers to support victims of violence in Citrus Heights. We were also able to use the space during the event to celebrate our donors and special volunteers, something that's difficult for us to do with limited funds. Stone's Gambling Hall is a lot of things to this region, an employer, a gathering place, and an incredible community partner and supporter of survivors of violence. Thank you. Speaker number 12. Hello, my name is uh, James Flannery and I'm here representing Stone's Gambling Hall. I really appreciate you guys uh, hearing me out and hearing everybody else out here. Obviously there's quite a bit on the line for a lot of us as you've heard so far and I'm sure we're gonna keep hearing. Um, I'd like to really talk a little bit about what we're all doing here today. I know that as uh, representatives of the Bureau of Gambling Control, that your number one interest is the public good for citizens here in California. Um, you hear a lot of testimonials from uh, cardroom employees and, and I'm sure a, a bunch more to come. We know why, why we're all here. Uh, we're here because we want uh, to continue to be able to provide for our families. Um, you, you hear from mayors and, and police chiefs that are, that are here hoping to continue to provide services to their city members. Um, I think if we take a, a, a little closer listen to some of the lawyers that have been here representing the tribes, it's pretty clear what they are here for as well. And that's something I'd somewhat like to focus on. Um, the, some of the language that they've used is that, uh, that all of this gaming activity is illegal and that these currently proposed uh, languages are just a step in the right direction. Um, listening with a, an attentive ear to what they have to say, it's pretty clear that that first step in the right direction is really ultimately aimed at the complete closure of, of all of our business. Um, a loss of, you know, two million dollars uh, down in Ventura. Uh, you know, we have 30,000 or more employees here statewide. Uh, that's a lot of affected families. Um, I think that if the purpose of this meeting is to get clear on what kind of language we need to have about systematic and continuous rotation of the player dealer position, then we should focus on, on what that would look like and we should, and we should craft up some, some language that is actually meant to serve the purpose of allowing for a player dealer position to systematically rotate so that these businesses may continue. Um, again, that's, that's not what the tribal representatives are here for, and I think we all know that. Um, please, please, please keep in mind that what you're hearing today, what you see in this room, this is just a very small representative of what we're talking about. And being that you guys are here on behalf of, of, the, of the public interest of the state of California, I know that, that you'll do what's right in the end here, and that is to go ahead and continue and allow us to uh, make our living and support our families and our communities. Thank you again so much for hearing me out. Speaker number 13. Hello, my name is Brian Altizer, B-R-I-A-N-A-L-T-I-Z-E-R. -I I'm one of the owners in Napa Valley Casino. And uh, I've been to a few of these workshops now and I hear a lot of the same things. And, you know, after this economic impact study came out, you know, I'm looking at this thinking, why would the state of California be doing something like this? Why would he be redefining legal terms? You know, is it for the Indians when they, you know, they tried to sue, got thrown out? You know, do they really have a case or do they just really uh, want more money? Think about how many of these tribes have put in nine figure reinvestment. So we're going to build this for 150 million. We're going to build this for 300 million. They're doing just fine. They want it all. You know who's not going to do just fine is the rest of the state. I mean, when you look at it, how many people in California are on welfare? I mean, that's a pretty big significant portion of the welfare in the country. It's already here. So do we need more? I don't think so. And I don't think that any of you do either. But making changes like this will take people from <coughs> great jobs, benefits, 
living wages to nothing. These aren't irrepla you know, easily replaced jobs. You know, a majority of my uh, staff is, does not have a college education. You know, a lot of them are, are immigrants. A lot of them are refugees. They came here to California and they found a good job. They found a way to build a good life. And now is that going to be taken away from them because the ultra-rich tribes want to get a little bit richer? That's not right. That's all I have to say. Speaker number 14. Good morning. Um, took a few notes just so I'm good. Um, my name is Audrey Lujan, A-U-D-R-E-Y, last name L-U-J-A-N. Um, and thank you again in advance for letting me speak today. Um, so my name is Audrey Lujan, and I have been at Artichoke Joe's for about six months now. But my history with the casino goes a lot, it goes back farther than that. Um, along with myself being employed there, my parents have both been there for over 30 years. Um, that says a lot about the devotion of the establishment has for its people and its customers, and I am a prime example of that. Um, my job position is nothing compared to this. Um, I work surveillance, and although I have only been there a short period of time, um, at any given day of the um, point, you can go into that casino and just see how thriving and engaged um, card room games are at the casino. Um, the casino is in the heart of the peninsula and right near San Francisco airport. Um, and at any point of the day during this 24 hour period, you can walk in and see how actively enjoyed it is. Artichoke Joe's has been a focal point for these card games for over 20 years now. Um, it brings the community in to engage and have fun, all the while returning its favor to its own city. Um, the proposed regulations would destroy that um, sense of community due to the fact that funds would be cut, causing job losses for over the 400 plus employees and their families, cutting tax revenue for the city, charities that we donate to over 20, um, it is even one of the very few card rooms that allow its workplace to be safe, smoke-free environment for all. As I stand here today sharing bits and pieces as to why our business is vital for our community, just like many others here today, um, implementing these proposals will do more, good, more damage than good. And um, we urge you to make the right decision, not only for myself, but all of us here today. Thank you. Speaker number 15. Um, I'm representing my husband, William Gene Sloan, S-L-O-A-N. And I'm going to read his statement. This is a really hard time for him. I am William Gene Sloan, and I am Cotto. I have been chairman of the Cotto tribe of the late New World Rancheria as my brothers and my grandfathers before me. As a member of the Cotto tribe, I felt that having a casino would bring economic advantages to the tribe, such as employment and revenue to our help our people. My niece was chairwoman at the time, I, I had, and she had asked me to take a leave of absence from my job to become general manager of the casino because the tribal council had concerns about the income the casino was generating and the difficulty of getting accurate accounting from the casino backers. I began watching and keeping track of the receipts and income from being generated. After several months of comparing those results with the reported amounts the backers provided to the council, I found multiple discrepancies worth thousands of dollars that were missing. The casino backers took me into the back office and threatened me to play ball or else something bad would happen to my family. I didn't play ball and shortly thereafter my family was disenrolled. My family consisted of one-third of the tribe. 
I discovered through court depositions that many members were paid $10 to vote my family out of my lifelong tribe. Since that day, I have lost my brothers, a sister, my daughter, and two grandchildren because of this. I have felt guilty for over 30 years that bringing gaming into our tribe and what it has done to my family. For the record, I don't oppose gaming, and the issue today to add card games to tribes will not only force the established card rooms out of business and many people to lose their jobs, but I fear for more Native Americans to lose their federal tribal recognition. If this group, group recommends tribal card games exclusive tri to the tribes, then I ask that compacts are only done with tribes who have not disenrolled or will not disenroll their citizens. I also recommend that any compacts also include revenue to help those Native Americans who have been disenrolled by providing housing, education, health, as promised in years past. I want to add a little bit. In my county, which is Mendocino County, there are 10 federally recognized tribes. Six tribes have casinos, five that are fully operational. Seven out of those 10 federally recognized tribes have disenrolled lifelong tribal members, centuries long before California became a state, and something needs to be considered. Thank you. Speaker number 16. Good morning. My name is David Lee, D-A-V-I-D-L-E-E. -E. I work for Night Adventures, a third-party gaming company. Um, before I start, I want to thank you guys for allowing impact commentary. Um, I think most of the people here um, are here because of how it impacts us. So thank you guys. I'm nervous. Um, as you guys, as we're going through more and more people, uh, my heart's beating faster and faster. Um, and that's because I'm not a public speaker. Um, I'm not a lobbyist or a lawyer or a figurehead of any kind. Um, I'm just a person who wants to work. Um, I think we're all people who just want to go to work at our jobs. And there's hundreds of people here. There's more, 32,000 more people in our industry who are all paying very close attention to these. Um, and that's because they're watching each person who comes up here uh, hoping that we have the words to articulate um, the message that we as a group want to convey. And I think that message is pretty simple. We just want to work and we just want to support ourselves and our families. <laughs> to tell you a little bit about me, um, I started at Knighted about six years ago. Um, I had never heard of the industry prior to coming in here, but what I was looking for was an entry level job that paid pretty well and gave me an opportunity to grow. That may not sound like a lot of requirements, but as someone with no college degree, no related experience, and no management or leadership experience, um, it was what I felt was all I had to ask for. And it's an opportunity that I got, and I don't think I would have been able to find it somewhere else. Working here, Sorry. I see you guys taking a lot of notes on the stuff that people are saying up here. I would like for you guys to write down a name. Ava Lee. It's A-V-A-L-E-E. -E. She doesn't work in the gaming industry. Um, she's my two-year-old daughter. But this impacts her. The funny thing about Ava is whenever I have a day off and I tell her about it, she asks me, are you going to take care of me, Daddy? And I get to tell her, I'll always take care of you, baby girl. Anyways, I think that recognizing the opportunities that I was given uh, at Night Adventures is what made me so passionate about growth. Um, and it's why I got involved in the development department of our company. With no experience, Knighted gave me the opportunity to start helping hire people um, and training them to give them the same opportunities that I was given. I eventually became a trainer, 
Uh, and then I started overseeing all of the training for a single casino. And eventually I was able to see all, oversee all of the training for the entire region of Southern California. Um, and then I was offered the opportunity to actually be in organizational development where I can help create and foster a culture of leaders and of growth. Um, the opportunities that were given were not just for me. They're for Sa uh, my wife, Sarah, and my daughter, Ava, as well. Um, and I just want to always be able to tell her, tell Ava, that I'll always take care of you. Thank you. Speaker number 17. All right, I'll just try to speak up. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. All right. This is an ongoing problem, so don't worry. All right. All right, so, um, hello, uh, my name is Emma Sesh, E-M-M-A-S-E-C-H-E. -E. Uh, I work for Knight Adventures, which is a, uh, one of the third-party proposition player services company. Um, I am a manager who has been working with this company for over six years. <coughs> Uh, I want to thank everyone for the opportunity to speak today uh, about this import important topic. Um, I want to start off by telling you uh, a story. When I was in high school, uh, I was very excited. I was old enough to be able to work, and so I was filling out my first resume, something I'm sure we all kind of can think back on, and what, oh, what, what kind of experience can I actually like relate to and be able to show to be able to get my first job. And so I'd written it out, handed it to my dad for him to proofread it, and he had pointed to some volunteer experience that I had with an organization uh, called Positive Images that is a uh, support group for queer youth in Sonoma County. And he said, uh, do you want to include this on the resume? Because this might affect you being able to get this, a job. And I thought about it for a second, and, and that before getting my first job, I made a resolve for myself that I would only work for a company that would accept me for who I am. And I have to say that Night Adventures has been one of those accepting companies that I am proud to work for. I've gone through my own personal process of feeling comfortable in my own skin. Uh, you can't see it today, but everyone who works with me knows that I actually wear like a suit and tie to work every day. Um, and in the entire time that I've worked with this company, the only thing that anyone has ever said to me about my dress code was complimenting me. Um, and so I also want to let you know that I am honored because there have been multiple people that I have worked with who have let me know that by seeing me being able to succeed um, in this company and starting from the very bottom as an associate and working my way up to this management role, that, that I'm someone that, I can, that they can relate to and seeing that it is possible for their, their own growth within a company. So I want you to think about that when it comes to the proposed language and how it's going to negatively impact this diverse company that I work for and the people that I care so much about. Care, that I care so much about. They are my friends and the people that I would call family. Not to mention the total statewide impact of 32,000 jobs uh, that would be lost based on the language that has been proposed. We are an industry and have companies that support our people and our communities. Um, I want to also remind you, uh, the first speaker that we had today uh, was an uh, attorney for one of the tribal casinos. I want to respond to something he says. He said, uh, I am not a long-standing problem. I am a person that asks for an opportunity to have a stable, well-paying, accepting job to be able to con a contributing member of our society. So please keep that in mind as you consider these proposed regulations. Thank you for your time. Speaker number 18.
different problem. <laughs> Don't let anybody tell you that sciatica is an Italian sports car. Uh, uh, my name is John Lovell. Uh, I'm a lobbyist at the Capitol. Uh, one of my clients is uh, Players um, uh, Poker in, uh, in Ventura. Um, I have also devoted 35 years of my life to lobbying for various law enforcement organizations, which I, I still continue to do. I, I think I was listening to the testimony at the beginning, and a little bit of history is, I think, worth a lot of argument. Uh, the um, lawyers from the tribes came up here and talked about, well, this is a step in the right direction and the lawlessness that's going on in card rooms and all of that colorful rhetoric. But what you weren't told is that before Proposition 1A was enacted by voters in 1998, tribal casinos used exactly the player-dealer um, strategies that are currently done in uh, card rooms. So no objection, suddenly Prop uh, uh, 1A passes, and oh my gosh, there's a problem with the card rooms. And they tried to sell that to three attorneys general, Bill Lockyer, Jerry Brown, um, and Kamala Harris, and they all rejected that, uh, that entreaty. There's never been any complaint, any public safety complaint about the player-dealer strategies um, in card rooms. And what is now before us, the preliminary proposals, I'll call them, um, is um, absolutely destructive uh, to cities and to public safety. Uh, I, I think it's, um, uh, you will hear, you've already heard some testimony from police chiefs. You will hear testimony from other police chiefs. In point of fact, California's police chiefs protect nearly three quarters of Californians. And you'll hear testimony <coughs> about the destructive nature of, of these um, regulations. And I'd ask you to consider the ironic juxtaposition. Here is a division of the Attorney General's office, the state's chief law enforcement officer. Yet these proposals are being vigorously proposed by the California Police Chiefs Association, who actually protect people on the ground, and they know the destructive nature of this to revenues of cities. And oh, by the way, the, uh, the proposal will also create an underground gambling uh, activity. Does anybody in this room seriously believe that someone is going to drive from their home to go to a card room to be able to play two hands and then told, oops, nope, you've got to quit now because you're not assuming the uh, player-dealer uh, position. Uh, what you're going to have, and the tribal uh, lawyers, I'm sure, think, well, they'll be coming to Thunder Valley. They'll be coming to us. No, what you're going to see is you're going to see underground gambling. Police chiefs have told me this. Uh, and so you have something that is going to reduce revenues for cities, destroy positive business uh, presence in those cities, undermine law enforcement funding, and oh, by the way, create an underground gambling economy as well. Think about this. This is a terrible idea without merit. Speaker 19. Good morning, Director Shimazu, panel members. Uh, I'm Steve Schreiner, here on behalf of Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino. And I guess, given our venue today, I should point out that my name is spelled S-C-H-R-E-I-N-E-R. Uh, Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino is a, a small card room by anybody's standards. It's just 22 tables. Uh, but along with the attached restaurant and adjacent hotel, it employs over 250 people. Uh, Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino is the largest private employer in the city of Lake Elsinore, and it's uh, second only to the school district there in terms of the number of people employed. The proposed regulation that's, that's before you now 
would essentially, let's just be blunt about it, it would put Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino out of business and it would put those 250 employees out of jobs. If the card room closes, the restaurant and the hotel will both go along with it and all those jobs will be lost. So I, 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 I could repeat or reiterate the comments that have been made by virtually every one of the impact speakers here this morning, but I'm not going to do that in the interest of time. I imagine there's probably a few people behind me on the sign-up list. But I do want to urge you on behalf of Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino's 250 employees, please, please reject the concept language that is under proposal here. Uh, we will also submit later written comments regarding Lake Elsinore Hotel and Casino's contributions to the city's tax base and to local charitable organizations. But for now, that's all I've got to say. Thank you for hearing me. Speaker 20. How are you? My name is James Brown Eagle. In 1999, I was the chairman of my tribe, the Lamb Indian Colony. I negotiated and signed the gaming compact, looking forward to a positive future for my tribe, one of the oldest dated tribes in California with a 22,000 year history in Lake County. Since 2006, Non-gaming tribes began to receive $1.1 million in quarterly payments. This never before source of uncontrollable, unaccountable income became a direct source for corruption and greed, leading to termination and really dismembering many community people from the reservations. An example of that corruption is my tribe passed a resolution that if the tribal leaders did not distribute their per capita payments within 24 hours, they would be recalled from their office. The, the officials are using this fund as political payola to keep themselves in office while implementing disenrollment and hiring corrupt attorneys to bring in and implement disenrollment and disenfranchisement. When I, in 1999, when I went to the negotiations, the attorney that I had was representing six tribes. He only, not only represented two, but he helped disenroll the other four. So there's a lot of conflict of interest and corruption with these gaming attorneys. In essence, many, many of the tribes, really what we've become is per capita prostitutes, our leadership. In 2010, Half of my tribe was disenrolled and then disenfranchised, finally, because they couldn't disenroll us because we were all immediate family members. The they moved off of the federally recognized reservation that they claimed to be the leaders of. And they were shopping, what you call casino shopping, for a new casino. Since then, my people have been subjected to many violations of human rights. And until the Bureau investigates this corruption, I do not support this, the tribe's right to have these exclusive funds. There's enough gaming funds for everybody in this room, and there's enough to share. So we need to stand up, and we need to bring justice. Too many of our people are dying in our communities, and I'm here representing those. We need to have a hearing, the federal government, on disenrollment and the corruption that this gaming money has brought to the state of California. Thank you. Oh. Speaker 21. Good morning, Ron Alex Sr. First of all, I'm not here for Indian gaming or the state. I'm full-blooded Hokomomono of the Bear Clan of California, born and raised, Vietnam veteran. Not fairly recognized 
or non fairly recognized or disenrolled by any documents. I'm just like many of the thousands of California Native American Indians that are unrecognized, that have no say or purpose when it comes to any decisions for the right to speak for Indian families, that are not recognized by any tribes or state agencies. Indian gaming does not benefit all California Indians, just members of that tribe that are fairly recognized and all approved by the BIA, Bureau of Indian Affairs, that determine blood degree for Indians. That also helps and justifies tribes' disenrollment. I stand here for culture, tradition, spirituality, and all Noom people. And in disbelief in how we are as Indians are treating each other. In closing, I'm not against gaming, just how decisions are made. Still see hope coming out of all Indian people. There are many gaming tribes that are helping Indian people, their members only. As an elder and a former tribal chairperson of a fairly recognized reservation, thank you for this precious time to speak as one Indian person without being asked to prove I am Indian. All my relations, oho. Speaker 22. Hello, my name is Elisa Sarando, A-L-I-S-S-A, S-O-R-O-N-D-O. -S -S so today I'm hearing how these casinos provide amazing opportunities for both the people and the community. But there is an underlying issue that still hasn't been resolved. These casinos can cause so much division between people. If you put a bunch of money in a room full of people and tell them to divide it, you're going to see greed. I am here today to speak to you from the people who have lost their voices but never lost faith. We need to do better at taking care of each other as people. We as Native people have been separated enough throughout history to keep doing this to ourselves. These casinos and land were given to us to help our people and it almost gave us a blind eye to the generational trauma our people have suffered. We are the standing receipts of what is left and you cannot erase what is inside of us. Imagine if we stood together and took care of each other as people in a world that is so selfish. <clears throat> we have to stop the disenrollment process. So many of my people are homeless and fighting drug addictions and they feel alone with no support. I speak from even my own family members. Am I saying that the answers are in the material? No. But what I will say is if our people felt more supported, maybe the trauma wouldn't win. At the age of 27, I can tell you how many family members I have lost during this fight of being heard, but it shouldn't take anyone to lose another family member. We need to stand together. So if this is what everyone wants, there should be more of a fight for all people, not just some. So I ask if for you, when you guys leave here today to leave with an open mind on the change you would like to see within our people. Thank you. Speaker 23. Good morning. My name is Jamie Dunaway, J-A-I-M-E-D-U-N-A-W-A-Y. I've written about Native American issues for publications like Slate Magazine, and I'm here today not only as a reporter, but as a Native American. I agree that the proposed regulation could hurt communities where card rooms exist, but also the Native Americans that tribal leaders say that it will benefit the most. The tribes already have a monopoly on gaming, and this regulation would essentially eliminate all outside competition. And because they're sovereign tribes, they have 
very little accountability or oversight. And in the past, this has led to tribal disenrollment. And thousands of people have been unlawfully removed from their tribes. The idea is that with fewer people in the tribe, the people who are left get larger shares of the per capita payments. But the people who are disenrolled don't get any medical or educational benefits. And they have few options for legal recourse or reinstatement. So tribal gaming has led to corruption and the proposed regulation gives tribal leaders even more of an incentive to continue this process of disenrollment. You've just heard the testimonials and I've heard thousands of more just like that in my reporting. So I encourage you as you consider this proposal to think of the people that it hurts in the Native American community as well as those outside of it. Thank you. Speaker 24. Good morning, my name is Vanessa Gonzalez, V-A-N-E-S-S-A-G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z, -E -E with Crew Strategies on behalf of the City of San Jose. The City of San Jose is very concerned with the proposed regulations governing the rotation of the player-dealer position. Card rooms are a significant source of revenue for many cities across the state, including the City of San Jose. In 2018, the city's two card rooms, Casino Matrix and Bay 101, generated $18.9 million in revenue for the city, for city services, and these card rooms both directly and indirectly generate roughly 1,768 jobs and more than $307 million of total econo economic impact. The city's local card rooms have been a steady anchor of support for the San Jose community, and the proposed regulations would significantly slow card plays, resulting in a loss of business that would have consequences for San Jose's card rooms and for city revenues. At a time when San Jose is actively mobilizing much of its resources to address affordable housing and prevent homelessness, we simply can't afford policies that further diminish revenue and urge you to reconsider the proposed regulations. Thank you. Speaker 25. Good morning, members of the Bureau. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Sonia Flores, S-O-N-I-A-F-L-O-R-E-S, and I'm here as an Education Commissioner for the City of Commerce, and on behalf of our Commerce Casino. Our city has benefited from a close, consistent partnership that generates over $16 million in tax revenue annually and employs over 2,500 people. Now, mind you, this is a city that's 90% Latino and about 40% of our residents don't have a, a high school diploma. And so this casino also provides much needed jobs and their turnover rate is extremely low, which as a department manager tells me, they're happy where they're at and it's a thriving business. Most of the Southern California card clubs are located in communities of color and the Commerce Casino is the largest card club in the state of California and for that we're grateful. This partnership generates sponsorships and funding beyond the tax revenue. For example, we have a fully funded scholarship program. Anybody in the City of Commerce can go to college with funding from our scholarship program and the anchor sponsor for that program is the casino the Commerce Casino. We also benefit from increased police and fire protection so that our kids can play safely in the park and enjoy the many city services that we're allowed to provide because of the donations and the revenue the casino provides. We also provide our citizens as an industrial community. We provide pollution and noise abatement that will lengthen the lives of the people living there that have to deal with constant pollution. I mean, you've all heard of the exide situation, right? That's us, that's right in our backyard and our residents are having their dirt cleaned of toxic pollutants. So all of this money goes to abate those situations now, I've worked in higher education for about 38 years, and I've witnessed all different types of students come in with all different types of preparation. 
and I can say the commerce students that go to college are among the best prepared I've ever experienced. And it's due to extensive city services and an excellent library that ranked in the top 90% in the whole state of California in our tiny little city of commerce with 13,000 residents, 3,500, 4,000 households at the most. And we're able to do that because of strong partnerships with business and industry, especially the Commerce Casino. We were seeing strong support, and we want to provide that support in return. The casino is an anchor partner for our city for the past 25 years. They've sponsored programs, city cleanups, uh, all different types of things that could go on and on. It goes beyond the tax revenue. So please help me understand why now. I know others have asked that question. Why now? What has changed so drastically in California that it necessitates a change in regulations? A change that would devastate ours and other communities on so many different levels. There's no need to pit communities of color against each other. This is not a zero-sum game. Everyone can win. There's abundance enough for all. I truly urge you from the bottom of my heart to consider the impact these proposed regulations will have on so many lives. The most vulnerable people in our society, people of color, senior citizens, children, please do not change the rules after 25 years of success. Thank you. Speaker number 26. Good morning. My name is Evelyn Diaz, E-V-E-L-Y-N-D-I-A-Z. And I am here in support of the Commerce Casino. I am a resident of the City of Commerce, the Literacy Program Manager for the City of Commerce Public Library, and the Treasurer for the City of Commerce Employee Association of ASME Local 773. Having grown up in the city and because of my various roles through the city, I self-identify as a walking product of commerce. I have lived in the city for 31 years and have participated in most, if not all, of the programs offered through the city and directly financially supported by the Commerce Casino. One of the programs that has impacted my life is the Commerce Scholarship, which the Commerce Casino generally donates $50,000 on an annual basis. The population of the City of Commerce is 94.8% Latinx, based on the educational pipeline of 100 Latinx students beginning elementary school, 0.2% graduate with the doctoral degree. I am one of the aspiring 0.2%, largely because of the direct support from the casino. Because of the scholarship, I stand before you with a bachelor's degree in sociology and Chicano Latino studies, and a master's degree in school counseling for both Long Beach State, and currently as a doctoral student in educational leadership at UCLA. As a past recipient of the scholarship and now manager of the scholarship program, I can personally attest to the positive impact it has had on my life and the students that have received the scholarship. The casino has supported education through the means of donations to the scholarship since its early stages in 1983. In total, the Commerce Casino has donated over a million dollars to the Commerce Scholarship. It has helped close to 2,000 students pursue their education by easing the financial hardship pursuing an education has. It has helped students see college as a viable option. Last year alone, we provided 72 scholarships. Let me repeat that because this is one of the many ways your decision will directly affect my community. Because of the annual $50,000 donation from the Commerce Casino, we were able to provide 72 scholarships to students to pursue their college education. The Commerce, Casino, the Commerce Casino consistently invests in their community, and I hope you will allow them to continue to do so. As a bureau, you have a responsibility to consider the rippling effects this change will have on the communities the casinos operate in. The thousands of students and that aspiring 2%. Thank you for your time. Speaker 27. Good morning. My name is Ron Lawrence. I'm the Chief of Police for the City of Citrus Heights here in Sacramento County, and I'm also the President of the California Police Chiefs Association. 
And I've had an opportunity to speak to numerous police chiefs and mayors throughout California who have casinos, and I'll tell you firsthand that they will all tell you that the proposed regulations will devastate many local communities and threaten to cause financial despair. Many of these cities will have to cut essential government services such as police and fire, but frankly, what's more alarming to me is the impact on people. These proposed regulations will put an estimated 66% of the industry's labor force out of work. These are real people with real lives, people in our hometown. Citrus Heights is home to middle-income families, hard-working people that depend on living wages, people just like in this room. And I want you to know, as a local police chief, I stand shoulder to shoulder with you on this very important issue. In my very own city of Citrus Heights, it would likely force our Stones Casino to close, causing us to lose more than 500 people to lose their jobs. This is alarming. The revenue generated by these games is vital to the success of card rooms and the success of many California communities and our families. The games affected by these proposed changes are controlled games which have been approved and in play in our jurisdiction for many years, without harm and without complaints. I've been a police officer for more than 30 years and a police chief for the better part of a decade, and I'll tell you that these regulations represent zero public safety purpose whatsoever. Furthermore, the proposed regulations offer no legislative solutions at all or alternatives, and this is unacceptable. Our police department has not had any issues at all with our Stones Casino, and on the contrary, they've been fantastic community partners, visible in our city and providing great jobs. Redevelopment in the area that Stones has been developed has reduced crime, has reduced the number of homeless persons, and resulting in more desirable venues for patrons and jobs. Stones is a strong supporter and partner of our police department, our community, and graciously gives to very, uh, lots of non local nonprofits. They've made numerous substantial contributions to charitable organizations in our city and throughout Sacramento County for many years. They've been so engaged with our local community that they annually award a, an, a 21 award that recognizes local businesses and nonprofits to a public leader who has, to, who has significantly made positive impact to their community. You heard from our domestic violence advocates in Sacramento County, Weave, earlier. They have been huge supporters, uh, donating uh, nearly $100,000 to the success of that program. I urge you to reconsider these proposed regulations that will cause irreversible cause uh, damage to our local communities throughout California. Speaker 28.